we now try several additional problems from Chapter 3 to test our ability to solve particle equilibrium problems. The first problem we'll examine is problem 325, where we're given a worker inside a truck exerting a force on rope ABC to slowly lower a box down a ramp. We're given the box's weight, and we're further given this slides without friction on the ramp, and that the pulley at B is frictionless. For the position of the box on the ramp given specifically in the problem 325 statement, we want to find the force the worker must apply to the rope and the reaction, the reaction force between the box and the ramp. And we're further told to neglect the size of the box and the pulley. So before we start this problem, we want to make several comments about the significance of some of the specifications of the problem statement and also the merits of choosing to isolate different parts of the problem in order to solve for what's requested. So we're told to neglect the size of the box and the pulley, and that's essentially code for treating everything as a particle. It also means specifically in this case that we're going to have to use the geometry given to determine some unit vectors and so, for instance, if we want the position of B, pulley B, with respect to D, we can see in the figure that B is 0. 0.0 meters to the left and 2.5 meters above D. And that would typically refer to the center of the pulley. If we're neglecting the size of the pulley, we won't make any distinction about the center of the pulley and specifically where the rope at B is coming off the pulley. So we'll just use the dimensions that are given in the figure as the basis for establishing positions and, and not worry about small distances uh, above and below the centers of locations that are given. We're also told that the pulley is frictionless, which means that whatever force is being exerted by the man, whatever tension he's putting the rope in at A, that will carry through all the way to C. So we have one continuous cable from A up and around the pulley here at B and down to C, and that will be all one cable and it will have a uniform tension in it. We're also told that the box slides without friction, and this is going to be important for our representation of a reaction between the box and the ramp. So we said that the presence of a reaction would indicate whether or not a degree of freedom would be, was being prevented or impeded. And the fact that the box slides without friction means that there is nothing impeding its progress between D and E. The box is unable to move through the ramp, so we're going to have a reaction force normal to ramp DE, but we will not have any reaction force tangent to DE because that would imply that there is some resistance to movement along the ramp. So this is significant because in different problems we might choose to use X and Y force components to indicate a reaction, but the fact that the box can slide down the ramp without friction implies that we have no component of force tangent to the ramp, and so it makes much more sense in considering the box on the ramp and the reaction exerted by the ramp on the box to use component directions that are normal and tangent to the ramp rather than ones that have X and Y components. Now before we begin, we can talk about the merits of, of choosing to isolate different components of this system to solve for what's requested. We're asked to find the force the worker must apply to the rope and the reaction between the box and the ramp. The fact that we're asked to find the reaction between the box and the ramp suggests that we probably want to isolate the box, and so we're going to be drawing an enveloping surface around the box at C, uh, and we'll get to that shortly. We might also ask if there's any merit to isolating the pulley at D or the man at A. If we were to isolate the pulley at D, we're cutting through the rope twice, once between AB and once between BC, but we would also be cutting through whatever support is occurring between the pulley and the roof of the truck. If, after the fact, we wanted to figure out what forces had to be supported by whatever bracket was there between the roof of the truck and the pulley in order to keep the pulley in equilibrium, 
then there might be some merit to drawing a free body diagram of the pulley. Uh, if we wanted to know the forces that the man exerted on the bed of the truck as he exerted this force on the rope, there might be some merit to isolating the man at A, but uh, unless we're asked specifically for forces that are required by the either the roof or the bed of the truck on either the pulley or the man, there probably isn't much reason to draw isolating surfaces around B or A. So I'm going to erase those and we'll just focus on the box at C. So we'll focus our attention on a free body diagram of C. I have the weight of C which is given. And then I'm cutting through the rope on this side. And the direction of that is going to be determined by a unit vector that points from C to B. So that's something we're going to have to determine as we set up this problem. And then as I mentioned, uh, between the box and the ramp, it makes more sense to talk about reactions normal and tangent to the ramp. Uh, we don't have any reaction tangent to the ramp because we're treating it as frictionless, so we're going to have a normal force which I'll represent as an unknown magnitude on a unit vector in the direction of the normal force, and we'll have to determine that as well. So that's our free body diagram, and uh, we have two unknowns, the tension in the rope and the normal force between the box and the ramp. Uh, now it's really a matter of using the geometry of the problem to determine these unit vectors, and then we can go ahead and solve for the unknown tension and unknown normal force. Now we have to establish a coordinate system somewhere, and I'm going to choose to do that at D. So I'm going to draw an XY coordinate system right here. There's nothing magical about that. I could choose to establish my coordinate system anywhere in this problem. The orientations are really defined by uh, the unit vectors associated with relative position vectors. So it won't matter where I choose that coordinate system, but that seems like a convenient place, and that's where I'll choose to do it. I can now write position vectors of different key points on this figure that will help me in establishing these unit vectors. So let's make a note that the position vector of E in this coordinate system will be 3.5 meters in I, and minus 1.2 meters in J. The position vector of C for the specific case of problem 325 is 3 quarters of the way down the ramp, so that's going to be 3 quarters of the position vector to E, and that turns out to be 2.625 meters in I minus 0.9 meters in J. The position vector to B is minus 0.8 meters in I plus 2.5 meters in J. The relative position vector from C to B is the difference between the position vector at B and that of C, and that turns out to be minus 3.5 425i plus 3.4j meters. I could find the magnitude of that position vector from the square root of the sum of the squares of its components, and when I do that I get a magnitude that's equal to 4.826 meters. My unit vector from C to B then is the relative position vector divided by its own magnitude, 
and that's minus 0.7097 in I plus 0.7045 in J. Now what about the unit vector for the ramp? You might note from the geometry of the ramp that there's a drop of 1.2 meters for a run of 3.5 meters, and if we were to find the hypotenuse of this triangle, it would turn out to be 3.7 meters. If we have a force that's normal to that, then you may or may not remember that the slope of the normal is the negative reciprocal of the slope of the ramp. So I would have a 1.2 run and a 3.5 rise for the direction of the normal and that would mean that my unit vector describing the normal orientation is 1.2 over 3.7 in the i direction plus 3.5 over 3.7 in the j direction. So with my unit vectors, I can now write a particle equilibrium equation. In vector form, this would look like my unknown tension on the unit vector from C to B, which I now know, plus the normal magnitude that I'm looking for on a unit vector in the normal direction, which I now know, plus the weight, which is going to end up being in the minus J direction, is equal to zero. So in terms of x and y components, I have minus 0.7097t in the i direction, and I have plus 1.2 over 3.7n in the i direction equals 0. Call this equation 1. And in the j direction, I have plus 0.7045t plus 3.5 over 3.7n minus the weight equals 0. And I'll bring the weight over the other side. It's 400 newtons. I'll call that equation 2. Now, I could, I could include the units here, but there, it's a little bit confusing because I have a symbol n for a normal force that I'm trying to find, and the weight is in newtons. So I might just note over here that everything in this problem is going to have units of newtons. In order to avoid confusion with the two n's, I'm going to leave those, I'm going to leave the newtons off, but we just understand that we're solving for tension T and normal force N in units of newtons. Now there's a lot of ways to solve this. One of the things I can do is just take the ratio 0.7045 over 0.7097. I can multiply that by equation 1 and add it to equation 2. When I do that, the term involving the tension will fall away and I'll be left with just a single equation in the normal force magnitude. So that will end up looking like this ratio times 1.2 over 3.7 plus 3.5 over 3.7 times the normal force magnitude equals 400 newtons. And if I then solve for n, that ends up being equal to 315.5 newtons. And then if I take that and back substitute it into either the first or second equation and solve for the tension, I end up with 144.2 newtons. The fact that these two magnitudes ended up being positive means that I've represented them correctly in terms of their direction in the free body diagram. I might make one other closing comment just about the figure. If you look again at that figure, you'll see that there is a 20 degree angle between 
the force the man is exerting on the rope and the vertical, uh, you might ask how that 20 degree angle is relevant to the problem at hand. And the answer is it's completely extraneous information. So that angle could have been given as 20 degrees or 30 degrees or 10 degrees or something else within reason that would have absolutely no influence on the problem.